welcome to another episode of Stagey Live. I'm your host, David Muskett. We have a phenomenal show today. Have a look at some of these names. Earlier this year, she won an Olivier Award for People, Places and Things, Denise Goff. Renowned critic from the stage, Mark Shetton. And Australia's own leading man, Rob Mills. Don't forget our Stagey Challenge, hosted by Simon Ray Harvey and Molly Roberts. First interview special guest with me, as you can see, uh, the lovely Denise Goff. Thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me. Denise Goff! So basically what's going to happen is there's going to be a massive round of applause when that happens. As there should be. Yeah. And, and they should be standing up. Can you let will. them know that? At home they will be, right now. <laughs> and, and when we transfer, because we're going to go into the Dominion or the Yeah, or absolutely. Um, and then Broadway. Why not? And there's going to be like glitter cannons. Fantastic. Um, I usually have them myself. <laughs> You came around. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, absolutely brilliant for you to, for, to do so. Um, one of the things I wanted to first off ask was um, where you got your inspiration to get into this business. I've always been a pretender, like since I was really small, and I remember kind of obsessively pretending to be. Like I remember, you know, do you remember the TV show MacGyver? Yeah, making a bomb out of a paperclip and uh, some buttons. As you do. Yeah, so I pretended to be MacGyver, but I pretended to be the actor playing MacGyver. So I had to be called Richard right. for about a year. That confused your parents? Richard Dean Anderson. Yeah, yeah. I think they'd kind of gotten used to like 11 of us, so that we all had something. Um, so I was a pretender, and I liked pretending. And I had different voices and different accents and all of that. But it was when I got on stage, I think, when I was... I first was on stage in Fiddler on the Roof in a really small part, which really bored me, but I loved the rehearsals and I loved the feeling of waiting backstage before you go on. And then I played Miss Hannigan and Annie when I was about 11, and I remember something went really wrong on the stage, and I made something up, and the audience laughed, and I thought, yeah, this is really, a really good, good thing. What, do you, can you remember what you made up? No. I think what I did was I pretended to choke one of the little children. <laughs> just like you do now. Yeah. In life. <laughs> was there literally 11 of you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's 11 kids in my family. Really? And yeah. where, whereabouts do you sit? Number there? seven. Lucky number seven. Wow. Yeah. Any of the, the siblings, have they got into the industry? My youngest well? sister, younger sister, Kelly, she's now an actress as well. Um, but no, nobody else. I mean, we were all, my dad's a really good, like, makes really great speeches and so does my mom and everything but you know we didn't it wasn't seen as a, a viable career choice you know in the west of ireland nobody really becomes an actor for real or an actress for real so um i don't know where it came from actually. and how did they take it when you, you said to them this is what i want to do for a living there's absolutely no way that's what i was going to do for a living it's ridiculous um i think they just hoped that it would wear off yeah but it didn't and now uh working out, isn't yeah. it? Or just sitting here in my dressing room <laughs> in the West End. When you did decide to go out and venture into the industry, did you have to do some of the smaller gigs to get yourself up to it? Yeah, of course. I did, um, well, first of all, I worked in bars and restaurants for years and years and years. Um, and um, then I went to drama school. I got a scholarship, thankfully. I wouldn't have been able to afford it otherwise. So I'm one of those actors who, actresses who, um, yeah, needed a lot of financial help and because I don't come from big money. Mm. So... Uh, I'm really grateful that that's how it worked out for me and that I went, went to drama school at a time when that was available to me. Um, and then when I left drama school, I did my first job at the Actors Centre mm -hmm. and I didn't get paid anything and I worked in a pub during the day and then I'd do the show every night and it was heaven, you know, because mm. I was working as an actress. I couldn't believe it. And yeah. then and then I started getting lucky. You know, I got a job at the Everyman in Liverpool, which was a brilliant first paid job to get. And then... And then I was here in this theatre with Holly Hunter. Mm. This was her dressing room. And um, and then I did actually like it in this theatre and it kind of started rolling on. But then I did have chunks of time when I was out of work and also it's always been theatre work that I've done. Mm. It's only in the past few years I've done bits of TV and film. Um, so I never earned anything and I wasn't able to save. It's kind of impossible to save on theatre wages, you know. Um, so I spent a lot of time broke and wondering how I was going to sustain an acting career, you know? which is why before this job happened, I had been out of work for 
a year and I think I'd done a little bit of radio in that time, which again, so grateful for. Um, but, but yeah, I thought maybe it was over. I, I would like to maybe do something with kids or something because mm -hmm. I found that they really helped when I was out of work. Yeah. Hanging out with children is a really good thing for your soul. Uh, because they don't care whether you're working or not. They don't care about the stuff that we say matters. Like, you know, as an actor or an artist, I think so much of the time our self-esteem is wrapped up in whether we're working or not. And the greatest lesson that I learned in that year out of work was that I can't do that anymore. I can't get my self-esteem from this job because it's too fickle and fleeting. And, and so hanging out with children kind of made me see that, you know, I'm still enough, even without a job. Yeah, exactly. And then I started sort of enjoying that, you know, life gave me what I needed. I was always able to pay my rent, God knows how. Um, I would have, you know, my sister looked after me. She lives around the corner and I could go around to her and eat there when I needed to. And I was always given what I needed and, and a lot of people don't get that, you know. So I was still in a fortunate position even though I wasn't working, and that was a really great lesson. And then once I learned that lesson, it was like suddenly the floodgates opened, mm -hmm. this part happened, and now my life is unrecognisable work-wise. Mm -hmm. But the great thing about it is that my actual life uh, is is my life, and it's really important, and yeah. I love it. Pop stars or anything you used to rock out in the bedroom to? Yeah, I mean, I do think I had a bit of an obsession with Carly and Jason, actually, <laughs> now that I think about it. Did you have the posters on the wall? Yes, I did. Who yeah. doesn't have the posters on the wall? I did. I had a big picture of Carly and Jason yeah. on the wall. Like, I look back and I think, God, I wish that my obsession had been, like, Michael Jackson or Prince or, mm. like... But they came kind of later. Yeah. I don't know. I was kind of obsessed with myself <laughs> and what was going to happen in my life. I yeah. was obsessed with my own storylines. In anything that you've got taught in your studies that, that still rings true today? Um, I remember having a teacher at drama school who would go to sleep if we weren't telling the truth on stage and that really stuck with me because I remember thinking you're never going to sleep when I'm on stage and he didn't and I'm really grateful to him for just not pissing about with any kind of he just was like Ugh, boring you're acting at me, stop acting at me. Um, so, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, just tell the truth. That's always been a thing. And David Mamet wrote about that too. Like, just get out of the way and tell the truth. Yeah. That's been my, yeah, like, do less. That's so many what? actors do so much, and you think, who talks like that? Mm -hmm. Like, if you were to talk like that in real life, people would think you're mad, <laughs> you know? And yet somehow because you're on a stage, speaking with a strange voice, yes. fine. Um, so no, do less, tell the truth, get out of the way, and don't let people go to sleep. Well, that's the hope when doing theatre. Yeah. Unless it's some unless sort of... Unless it's some sleepies. Unless it's Sleepy a, an art installation <laughs> or something. Yeah. With Tilda. <laughs> Is there anything about the industry that you'd like to see improve or...? Of course, 50-50. Yeah. Gender equality, diversity, especially diversity in award ceremonies, mm -hmm. like, it, that has to change, just has to change. And, um, you know, women need to be, you know, treated, like, equally yeah, sure. to men. I was, yeah, I, I, I posted this thing on Facebook the other day about um, actresses reading casting calls that they got, you know, true casting calls and things like lead male can be between 30 and 55, lead female between 80 and 30. And you just think, wow, that's still happening. So stuff like that, you know, more education, but I think that all comes with education though. I don't think there's any point in haranguing or like getting kind of crazy about it it's just it's kind of laughable we need to yeah. laugh in the face of it and then make changes you know yeah. awareness we've now become aware of the things that need to change we need to accept that these are the things that need to change and we need to take action so three a's three a's awareness, acceptance and action that's what needs to happen in the industry Boom. gender equality yes
Well, thank you very much for uh, letting us come and have a visit today. You're welcome. Um, absolute pleasure. Uh, and I'm sure everyone at home uh, hopefully has taken a little bit of something out of that, which uh, is some amazing information. Um, for anyone who's out there that hasn't seen people, places, and things, it's not about heights. It's not about heights. It's about drugs. About drugs. And hugs. Mm -hmm. And snugs. <laughs> and bugs. And tugs. <laughs> So. And mm. and oh my god. I've got nothing else. I've We're nothing out. Else. We're out. High five. High five. Stage you Golf out. Yeah. <laughs> now it's time to head to a back alley. A very special guest with me today. I've got the lovely Mark Shenton. out there that isn't aware of what you do, please let us know what uh, you do within the industry. Right, I'm a theatre critic and arts journalist. I've been a, a writer for the last uh, 20 years, but I've been full-time doing this for the last 15 or so. Um, and I write for lots of different people, only people pay me, basically, as a freelance. <laughs> um, but I, I'm the associate editor and joint the theatre critic on the stage which is the leading industry paper here. Before that, I've also been on a national newspaper. I also write for all sorts of people. Oh, wonderful. Now, look, listen, thanks for coming to this uh, lovely establishment that we've organised here, into a back alley. It's um, illustrious. <laughs> now, so, how you got into the industry? How, how, what, at what point in your life did you say, this is where I want to head? Well, actually, I realised very early on, I was bitten by the theatre bug, as all, of, as all of us are in some way or another, but I was bitten very early on. I was 13, in growing up in South Africa, I saw a production of Terence Rattigan's The Deep Blue Sea, which has actually been revived at the National uh, this summer, um, and it's still one of my favourite plays. I don't really understand how a 13-year-old boy related to the story of unrequited love, <laughs> uh, and not having experienced unrequited love at that point, of course, since then I have experienced the emotions of the play described, but um, it, it blew my mind and I knew that's what I wanted to devote my life to doing is to somehow be in the theatre and actually I knew early on that what I wanted to do was write about it. Oh fantastic and what was it about that show? I mean are you looking forward to going in and seeing it when it goes on? I, I, I've seen the play countless times since in the years since in, in I think probably much better productions than the original production I saw but I've seen it's one of those plays that fantastic actors are always uh, attracted to. Uh, in the West End we've had Penelope Wilton, we're now going to see Helen McCrory in it Who's, who's a phenomenal actor. Yeah, phenomenal. Um, so uh, it, it, it was something res about the play that resonated for me. Um, and Rattigan is, you know, he's, he's, he was a, a playwright who's sort of written out of history for a while because his, his era in the 50s was superseded by John Osborne. But, but, but nowadays he's made, making this huge comeback and you know lots of people do his plays all the time now, thankfully. <laughs> well, that's very good to hear. Um, and are you one of those people that I, I can just imagine you're a wealth of knowledge when it comes to everything to do with the theatre industry. I, I'm sure if there was ever a pub quiz and the theatre industry came up, you would be the man to have on hand. I hope, well, hopefully, hopefully. I mean, one of the things about, about theatre critics, I think, is that we're very, hopefully, we're very informed. We know our stuff, and that's the, there's no point having experts unless they're experts. Um, and one of the, and passionate. And one of the things I am is very passionate about the theatre. I love the theatre with all my heart, and, and I go to the theatre between six and ten times a week. Wow. Um, now, having said that, I also think one of the reasons I'm a theatre critic is because theatre tickets are quite expensive, and, and my lifestyle would be unsustainable if I had to pay for them. How demanding. Yeah. Um, going, being a theatre critic is a fairly demanding task because, of course, the glamorous side is you go into a theatre every night, you're going to first night, you're mixing with celebrities. There is that side of things. The other side is the hard work. Mm. Um, because it's not just a question of watching the show, it's also got to write about it, research it. Um, and I also do lots of interviews and profiles with people. So I'm working pretty much all the time. Um, I find I, there are not enough hours in the day, so I tend to get up at six in the morning. Wow. I start my working day at six, writing until um, lunchtime roughly. I then try and have a bit of time off in the afternoon and then go to the theatre in the evening and then come home from the theatre and write straight away again. With, with the reviews I write, I have to write them the moment I get home, and they're up and online within a half an hour of me getting home. It's it's always amazed me reading reviews and, and seeing all the detail that a lot of people go into. And I know reading a lot of your reviews, you go into some absolute fabulous detail. And for me, it, it's always been 
I, I can hardly even remember lines half the time, let alone remember what's happened in a, in a two and a half hour show. Yeah, it, you, there, there's, there's, a, there's a huge discipline to, to writing about the theatre, which is that you obviously you sit there and you take no notes. Basically, you can't read them because you're writing in the dark, but, but it's a way of focusing your mind. Um, and also, I think you get, it's a, like an athlete, you get trained into doing it, you, you start to absorb the details that are important. Um, and, and actually, ultimately, it's a very personal response. I mean, I would say there's no, no such thing as right and wrong in theatre criticism. It's always one person's opinion. It's an informed person's opinion, but it's a question of taste a lot of the time. So you can't surrender yourself to being the definitive word or expect yourself to be the definitive word on anything. Um, I, I mean, I take my responsibilities very seriously as a theatre critic. I mean, it's, 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 an, it's a very treasured part of, of, of the theatre industry, but at the same time, it's not the only, the, the be all and be all and end all. I know it must be quite grueling to, to go through that every day. Is there any? Do you feel any pressure within the role? Is, is there anything that really weighs heavy on you when you're well, writing? Well, there's a huge responsibility because obviously your um, your, your words are going to be felt by the actors, um, and that's something you have to absorb. Um, at the same time, there's also nowadays for these critics, um, um, that Twitter and and Facebook and places like that, a much higher degree of accountability. I mean, they always have always been accountable. We're accountable to our readers, to our newspaper that we work for, whatever. But now you can actually get the actors and the creatives answering back on Twitter. Has and they ever, do. Has that ever, uh, have you experienced that first hand? Absolutely. Um, and, you know, and sometimes it's not pleasant. Mm. But, but at the same time, you also have to hold on to what, 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 what you, is, it is only a matter of opinion and you hold on to what, what you've said. Sure. I, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a massive job that you do and it's, I, I think it's quite integral into the industry. But for, for some of the people out there that might be interested in getting into that line of work, what, what advice would you pass on to them? Well, uh, lots of everybody now, everybody nowadays is a theatre critic, and um, thanks to Twitter and Facebook, everyone's got an opinion and everyone has a way to express it. In the good old days, um, there were 12 newspapers, and those were the only, those were the only ones who expressed it. And I now say that we're not the last word, the, 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 the last word in the production, we're the first word, and that, that, that's all there is. Um, but um, in terms of getting into it, and there's many more opportunities now than there ever were. You can set up a blog, you can set up a, 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 tw a Twitter account, um, but of course, it's it's a democracy, and it's whether or not people want to read you. So you have to you, you have to be worth have something worth saying for people to read you, um, and. Uh, uh, so you can become anybody can become a critic, but whether or not you're actually read is another question. Exactly. Now, where, whereabouts can people uh, read any of your your backlog or, or um, see any of your information? In particular, the stage, the stage.co.uk is the website. But it's also a weekly newspaper. I also have my own personal website, which is shentonstage.com, and I also have a Twitter account, which is shentonstage. So those are the good places to track me down. Lovely. Well, absolute pleasure having you on the show, Mark. It's been a, a, a fantastic experience. I hope some of you got some, uh, some great information out of that. Um, everyone, please put your hands together for Mark Shenton. Thank you. See, I imagine everyone clapping at home now. So everyone doing, yay! Maybe streamer pops and stuff like that. Thank you. <laughs> that was Mark Shenton. Now off to the Daisy Studio. Gentlemen, we've got a very special guest coming up, uh, Rob Mills from Australia. Uh, he is an amazing talent. Uh, he's worked on a fair few shows back at home. Uh, he's dialing in right now as we speak. We've got the Stagey Live satellite dish just getting into position. Rob, are you there? Thanks very much for having me, mate. Rob, absolute pleasure for you to be on the show um, and for us to have you on it. Um, what's the weather like down under? Oh, it's brilliant. Uh, perfect one day and pissing down the next. It's great here in Sydney at the moment. Right, now, you've had a bit of an interesting journey into musical theatre. Um, tell us a little bit about how you ended up getting into the industry. Uh, mate, loved musical theatre as a kid. Sound of Music, Mary Poppins. Uh, my parents were a fan of the opera when I was a kid. But I suppose it wasn't until after sort of my idle journey and going through pub rock bands for years and years that I uh, sort of fell in love, actually was on the West End. I saw Wicked, and saw Avenue Q, and We Will Rock You, and I realised, wow, musical theatre's not just all Rogers and Hammerstein, and old school jazz hands. It's uh, cool rock songs, contemporary pieces, and um, and a whole lot of fun. So that's, that's for me, and how I sort of fell in love with it, and then just auditioned 
for, for Wicked um, many, many times and then finally got into it and then just fell in love with the, uh, I don't know, the musical theatre here in Australia. It's been great. And this year you did Ghost. What was that like? Uh, it was great. Six months uh, of a tour all around the country. Uh, picked up a Helpman nomination, uh, which I suppose is like an Olivier Award over there. Uh, for Best Actor in a Musical, which is pretty cool. Up against uh, Anthony Waller, who is the guy that I saw in Phantom of the Opera when I was a kid. So that's pretty cool, pretty chuffed. But yeah, the, the, the run was great. Incredible cast, great crew, and it's a, it's a beautiful story. And did you do loads of research on Casper, you know, to get into character? Uh, not Casper, uh, but I did, I did watch the film back uh, before we started and realised that Schwazy, he was uh, he's a very charming man and was very well cut. So I was doing a shredding for Schwazy uh, before and during the run of Ghost because I had to take my top off. Luckily I didn't have to wear any of his um, baggy uh, maroon silk shirts though in the show. I'm glad they updated the wardrobe for our show. And talk us through your first ever job, um, your first theatrical gig. What was it like when you um, got the call? Well, I'd, or I'll talk about, my, I suppose, my first big audition. Uh, I, I really, I, I did a small musical called Hair in, uh, in Perth, but then found out that Wicked was coming and prepped, probably over prepped, but you can never over prep for this, um, for this thing. And I had four auditions. I thought I blew the first one from the bad singing, bad dancing kind of call that I did. Uh, but after f like three months and four auditions later, um, yeah, I got a, my manager came into, um, I just moved into my new house in, in Melbourne. Um, so I got the keys to my first ever place and she came over with a bottle of champagne for me. She said, congratulations on the house and you've booked Wicked. I remember the day, 2008, February the 2nd, uh, I cried a lot. I was very excited because it's something that I'd really, I'd wanted for, for so long. Now you're a cheeky chappy, I think, don't think there's any denying that. What's the best prank you've ever played? I just like trying to make Gemma Ricks laugh a lot on this last show. Um, she had colouring books backstage she would colour in, so there was a moment at the restaurant scene where um, we would be looking through her artwork that, she, that she'd done. So I grabbed some colouring pencils and grabbed some of the worst colouring books and just ripped them out and put them in the Thing and said, I just love your work, it's beautiful. And uh, it made her laugh a lot, that was good fun. And what's a day in the life of Rob Mills look like, you know, just on average? Uh, when I'm doing a show, it's pretty routine of like get up, gym, eat food, um, practice guitar, um, maybe learn some new songs, uh, maybe read, and Netflix and chill is definitely in there. But day in the life is always different. At the moment, I've been doing voiceovers, which has been fun. Um, but definitely it'll include a lot of eating, a lot of exercise and if I can, definitely a nap. I love a nap. And some kind of performance, even if I don't have a paid gig, I'll probably just be in the car singing or just pick up the guitar and practice. Fantastic. And you know, obviously you're immersed in it back at home, the, the industry back in Oz. Um, what's it like? What, what's the talent like over there, the talent pool? What's the projects like? Yeah. Oh, this, the industry here, it's thriving. I, I think it's thriving. Um, box offices are selling really well. There's some great shows that are coming out here at the moment. We have Singing in the Rain here. We have Aladdin. Um, Ghost has just finished up. Um, there's a new Australian work, work called Dream Lover. The Bobby Darren story just about to open. Book of Mormon will be here soon. Kinky Boots. So it's there's quite a few shows um, that are on at the moment. Uh, Australian production of Georgie Girl, which is the Seekers musical, is still going, and we've got We Will Rock You as well. Um, I, I mean, obviously it'd be great if there were more like the West End, but we just don't have the population. But we definitely do have the talent. Uh, I was just in Broadway and saw a few shows over there and realised that our shows are just as good, um, and our talent definitely holds up against the, um, the Americans. And from the last time I went to London as well. So, yeah, I think we've got a, a great theatre scene here and I think people still love a night out at the theatre. I mean, it beats Netflix. The best thing about going to the theatre is you're getting something live every night. A live orchestra, a live acting, anything can happen. Um, okay, so we've got a couple of rapid fire questions now. These are for the fans at home. And, you know, and let's not take it too seriously, but this is stuff that we really want to find out. So, you with me? Far away. 
Favourite film? Identity with John Cusack. It's a good thriller. Cook or take out? Um, I like to cook. But I also like to take out. Damn it. Can you speak any other languages? No hablas espanol. What's your favourite Spice Girl? Sexy Spice, is that, is that what? Uh, Mel B. I, I, yeah, Mel B. I like Mel B. Have you ever done bungee? Yes, I have bungee jumped uh, in Cairns and it's terrifying. I will never do it again. Uh, Would you prefer hamburgers for hands or sausages for toes? Hamburgers for hands, they're delicious. And what's the funniest face you can pull? And to all our viewers out there that might be interested in getting into the industry, you know, what piece of advice would you pass on to them? I think the best piece of advice would be practice, practice, practice. Um, practice your craft uh, as much as you can and not just, I mean, especially if you want to be a musical theatre, I would say practice everything else other than musical theatre. Uh, because you can get stuck in that sort of mindset. But practice auditions. You may be the best singer, the best dancer, the best actor, but if you can't audition in the room, no one will ever see you on the stage doing that. So I would practice performance. I found that the more I performed, the more confident that I got. And as a performer, I think our job is just to be, um, to make the audience feel comfortable. So the more confident you are, the more comfortable you feel, the more comfortable the audience will feel. Um, but yeah, practice your auditions. I think that's, that's, a, main, that's a main thing. Um, what would be, you know, if you, if you got called up at the last second, what would be your go-to audition song? Celine Dion, it's all coming back to me now. I feel as crying in the ends than that you learn. No, it's not that. Um, I do love that song though, and it should be in every girl's repertoire. <laughs> Probably not every guy's. Um, I had an emergency audition in New York a few weeks ago and I went with Moving Too Fast um, by Jason and Robert Brown. Thank you very much for coming on, Rob. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Rob Mills, uh, an absolute star back in Oz and uh, very much appreciate having you on the show. Thanks, mate. Thanks for having me, guys. See you soon. Brexit. <laughs> alphabet challenge. It's a tricky one. We've got two competitors. They are both going to have to fill their mouths with a spoonful of flour and then see how far through the alphabet they can get without spitting out the flour. Who is playing? Okay, so here we are at the flour alphabet challenge. Uh, on our left, who do we have? What's your name and which college are you representing? My name's Matt and I'm representing London College of Music. Lovely. And what course are you studying there? Musical theatre. Wonderful. Lovely. Uh, so, how are you feeling about today's challenge? Give me some words, some buzzwords. I'm pretty excited. A little nervous. Um, not sure how I'm going to handle it, but we'll find out soon enough. Wow. A range of emotions there. <laughs> uh, over to you. And our next contestant is? Jack. And who are you representing, Jack? Yeah, I'm representing E15. Fantastic. Uh, how are you feeling about today? Very confident. Yeah, it's something I've trained in a lot, so... I'm very confident. very confident this is what we like. Uh, I think we're going to have a good competition. Um, so who would like to go first? Why not? I'll go first. Fantastic. So uh, I'll pass it back over to you. Great. So just to recap, guys, uh, for this challenge, you have to put a spoonful of flour into your mouth and then try and get as far through the alphabet as possible. Tricky. Okay, some cakes could be made. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go. Student one. Mad ready! Okay, here we go. Spoon is going in. Ready? And go! I think it's all gone. <laughs> Matt got to end oh, finale. Yeah. Let's look at a replay. Yeah. I think it's so gone. Student.
one, two, Jack! Ready! Okay, so Matt's got to end a very good effort. But Jack, can you do better? I'm gonna try to. All right, here we go. Spoon in. And go. <laughs> and we got to Q! And he's been sick. Great. <laughs> Jack got to Q for. Quinn Couple. Instant replay. <laughs> Time to crown the champion! Oh. So, the winner of the Flower Alphabet Challenge was... Jack! Whee! And Jack gets to win a juicy marshmallow. And the loser of today is... It's Matt. It's Matt. And uh, Matt today, what do you win? What would you like? What would you not like? I don't think you want this. It's a lemon. A juicy, sour lemon. Enjoy. Wow. Join us next time for more challenges on Stagey Live. Bye. So, Tim. We made it through another episode. We had some laughs. We had some good times. I want to thank everyone for joining in again. And make sure you follow us on at Stagey Live. And with that said, there's only one thing left to say.